So, let's talk about the worst episode of Mega Man Anti Warrior The Incredible Rush. Now, anyone who actually watched Anti Warrior knows that the series is full of moments that are incredibly silly in both the English and Japanese versions, but this one by far has to be the weirdest and cringiest. The gist is that due to a weird electrical storm, a cat-based program at Scilab mutates into a giant virus and can go between the real world and cyber worlds. Its presence causes other navvies in the city to start mutating into weird cat hybrids, and the episode is also loaded with cat puns, and navvies acting like cats in general. This whole episode is basically like a less lewd version of that about to hit him with that furry sh meme, but with Mega Man. The way they catch the virus is dumb too. Lan uses a Raton battle chip, and when it explodes, he blames it on the virus, causing the catified navvies to attack the virus. After they catch it, they make a vaccine program, and everything goes back to normal. Other episodes of this anime are weird and dumb, but this one was just catastrophic. Today is Valentine's Day, so let's talk about romance in Rockman EXE. There's an episode of Rockman EXE Access where Lan takes Meilu out on a date to an amusement park, but for some reason, this is one of the handful of episodes that didn't get dubbed. Long story short, after watching Lan fight so many times using Crossfusion and nearly getting killed, Meilu starts dreaming about using Crossfusion herself to defend him. She gets her chance to try when Swordman attacks the amusement park while she and Lan are on the date, but it doesn't work, so Lan has to save her. The rest of the episode is basically just Meilu reminiscing about how much Lan means to her. Not really sure why this episode didn't get dubbed. It didn't really seem to have anything that couldn't be covered by the normal style of censorship that the rest of the dub used, but it was basically just a filler episode full of Land and Meilu shipping, as well as teasing cross-fusion role for the stream arc of the anime. Maybe they just didn't want to dub it because it was toward the end of the Dark Protoman arc of access and they didn't want to break story flow too much? A lot of episodes around that number mark were simply not dubbed for one reason or another. Anyway, happy Valentine's Day everybody, and may your dates not be haunted by Darkloids. We've already talked about how silly Mega Man NT Warriors anime is, and today we have a new topic of conversation, the Spice Master 9000. This is an automatic curry making machine developed by Yahoot, I think. For those who don't know, in the anime, after the World 3 was defeated, the members start a curry restaurant to raise money to help rebuild World 3. In the episode The Great Curry Battle, Lan goes on a tour, trying countless curry dishes, and the climax of the episode is a net battle, where World 3 challenges Lan and Mega Man, and the Spice Master makes curry dishes by mixing spices together based on how well World 3's members are performing as a team, to increasingly better results. When Lan's friends show up, the machine scans them, and it creates, as Yahoo describes, the ultimate curry of the gods. The battle ends with the machine destroyed. My question is that if this machine has the capability to create such perfect curry, then why didn't World 3 simply use it in their restaurant? They could have gotten better at teamwork over time and made better and better curry until they eventually reached perfection and could have made a ton of money off of it. Just another silly episode in this silly series. Anyone who watched Mega Man NT Warrior will likely remember that there was a small stretch where Mega Man mastering the program advance was a big deal. By combining Cyber Sword, White Sword, and Long Sword, a giant energy blade was formed and would unleash a massive amount of power. However, what if I told you that this wasn't the super iconic Life Sword? In Battle Networks 2 through 6, Sword, White Sword, and Long Sword makes Life Sword, a giant green blade that does 400 base damage. However, in Battle Network 1, instead, you get Beta Sword, which attacks with 6 total slashes, 2 short, 2 wide, and 2 long, each one doing 80 damage. While in the English dub, they don't name this program in advance, in the Japanese version, they state that the giant blue energy blade is in fact Beta Sword. Yeah, that's totally bogus. Since this is an adaptation, and the Life Sword is far more memorable than Beta Sword, I think they should have taken the liberty to change this to Life Sword instead. Life Sword did show up in Access, though, using the same combo of chips, so I guess it all evens out. I've recently been collecting the DVDs for Mega Man NT Warrior, and I didn't realize it, but in addition to several episodes not being dubbed, several of the episodes are out of order in their English release, both by broadcast date and the episode number on the DVDs. For some of these, like Chess Mess or Chisousen Town, the air date isn't super important because they don't advance the overall story, but episodes like Ice Ice Baby, The Incredible Rush, and Hot Tempers, these rearrangements cause continuity errors. The Incredible Rush shows us that Rush could go in between the cyber and real worlds at will, but other dubbed episodes that show him in the real world World aired before this one, and Hot Tempers features Torchman, which breaks continuity at this point because Torchman had been reborn as Heatman and wouldn't return to being Torchman until Access. Hot Tempers, Don't Mess With Mama Zap, The Great Curry Battle, and Princess Pride's Introduction episode were all on Disc 12, but these are supposed to take place before the Grave Arc, and Tori Freud and Iceman's intro episode was on Disc 11, despite them showing up in the earliest episodes. This is even stranger because Land's voice actor changes early on in the series, so if you watch these episodes in chronological order, then his voice changes back and forth. This whole thing is just a big mess. I already complained about how the home release of the NT Warrior anime got several episodes out of order, but believe it or not, the VHS release was even more messed up than the DVD release. Not only are the aforementioned missing episodes still skipped, but there are even more that are missing. 
The VHS tapes only released the first six volumes, and while the DVDs had four episodes per disc, the VHS tapes only had three per tape and skip every fourth episode. So that means that volume one would have episodes one, two, and three, then volume two would have episodes five, six, and seven, and so on. This means that several key episodes got skipped. Not only do we completely skip Iceman's intro, but now also Higsby's and Number Man's, and we also skip Evil Empress Roll Part 2 and Pharaoh Man Reborn. Why did they do it this way? Well, it's simple. As an incentive to buy the DVDs. Look at what it says. Includes one bonus episode, only available on DVD. I love the Rockman EXE IP, but this has got to be one of the worst release methods that it has ever seen. And skipping episodes to make you buy the DVDs is just plain greedy. I decided to take a look at the unlocalized episodes from Rockman EXE Season 1. First up is Episode 26, Bizarre, Mystery of the Ghost Ship. The gist is that after the N1 Grand Prix, Land's second place prize is a sightseeing tour around the world. On his first stop, he and his friends are playing at the beach, and then Tori and Mesa get abducted by a ghost ship. It turns out that it's actually not ghosts, but viruses, and Mesa says that because men of the sea understand each other, he can talk to the ship's AI, which is a null virus from Battle Network 2. All in all, not sure why he didn't get dubbed. Nothing really bad here that couldn't be covered by Viz's normal style of censorship. But at the end of the day, this episode just wasn't very interesting. I was wrong. I take it back. I haven't cringed this hard in a long time. This episode, To Become an Idol, just makes me uncomfortable to watch. This is the introduction of the net idol named Aki, who isn't a Navi, but is still an AI, and there's an Aki lookalike contest, and all the female characters decide to enter, including Meilu and Yai. The outfit already looks silly, but it's also rather revealing. When someone is kidnapping the contestants, Lan, Dex, and Tori also dress up like Aki to serve as decoys. Even after the crisis is over, they put the costumes back on at the end of the episode. There's also some animation errors, and Aki's 3D model is downright hideous. Like, almost Beast Wars Season 1 levels of uncanny. Do yourself a favor and skip this episode. The Incredible Rush may be the worst dubbed episode, but this one beats it by a long shot. Another episode of Rockman EXE that was never localized was Take Me Out to the Ball Game. A new student transfers to Lance Class, who happens to be the son of a famous baseball player, and his name is Kyuta. He misses his old friends and teammates from his old school, so Lan and company organize a net baseball game to make him feel more welcome. He uses a baseball-themed navvy named League Man. Aside from the fact that Kyuta never appears again, as far as I know, I'm not sure why this episode didn't get dubbed either. Nothing here that really needs censoring. This episode could likely have been fully uncut. No violence or aiming busters at the screen whatsoever. Maybe it's because they thought that League Man's design looked too much like blackface? But if that was the case, then why didn't they just change his skin color? I've seen this kind of editing done before, even in Mega Man. If there was anything worth censoring in this episode, I would say that was it. I just don't understand Viz sometimes. You're not missing anything by skipping this episode, though. Our last unlocalized episode for the first Rockman EXE series is Secret of the Ayano Koji House. This was a weird one. A robot vacuum that looks like R2-D2 plus the vacuum from Teletubbies gets a virus and sucks up everyone's PETs, so it's a chase to get them back. Yai tells us that the mansion is riddled with traps, and this is basically the anime version of the Natopia Castle dungeon for Battle Network 2. There's only one net battle in this episode, and it's against who I think is the prototype for Kendo Man. The episode ends with Yai's house turning into a transformer and flying away, but this goes nowhere, just cutting ahead to three days later when a washing machine does the exact same thing. This episode just feels like a waste because it reveals a long-time connection between Yai and Shaw's families, and shows us a maid that refuses to help Yai out of a trap, but this goes nowhere either. Like, they could have used her as a plot twist or something, like she was working for Shaw's family, but they didn't. A lot of build-up for an empty payoff. Now we move on to the unlocalized episodes of Access. This one is Fly to Shisa Island, which is the only anime appearance of Windman. This is especially funny because even though Windman never actually did appear in the dub, he did get an action figure under the name of Wind Blast Man. Anyways, during a nut battle exercise, Lan uses a wind chip that suddenly blows Mega Man, Roll, and Iceman to a different part of the cyber world where they meet Windman. The operators have to go to Shisa Island to find them and meet Windman's operator, Lily. Miss Yuri steals the idol of Shisa, the wind god that serves as a weather control device, and Mega Man and Windman have to team up to defeat Needleman. So why was this episode never dubbed? Because Lily, presumably a minor, spends half of the episode drunk. This is in line with the games, but I guess they just couldn't get around this with their style of censorship. At least they didn't say that it was just soda and she got dizzy from all the bubbles. The next episode that was not localized is titled Go to Hell by Train. The setup here is that Lan and Chisao are on a train, and due to meddling from Sparkman, an oil tanker car becomes detached from the train it's on and connects to Lan's train. He then sends a bunch of viruses to mess with the electrical systems and zaps the engineer, knocking him out. The train is set to crash and explode if Sparkman and the train itself aren't stopped. The episode seems very similar to the second episode of Season 1, Subway Scramble. So why did this one not get dubbed? Maybe the idea of hijacking and exploding upon collision would remind people too much of 9-11, even though Subway Scramble featured hijacking as well? Or maybe it just didn't match up with the flow of the rest of the episodes being released at that time, since this was late in the series towards the end of the Dark Protoman arc? That's the best guess that I can come up with. This episode missing means that we also never see how Mega Man got Wood Soul, even though he still uses it in the dub. 
The same can be said for Wind Soul, which we covered last time. Up next is the anime's take on the Top Man scenario from Battle Network 4, Top and Grandson. The setup is more or less the same as it was in the game. Top Man's operator, Tensuke, wants to connect with his grandson, Kosuke, but he's not good at net battling, although he knows a lot about tops. Lan agrees to show him the ropes, but Tensuke rage quits after a few failures and builds a battle top that catches some viruses and goes on a rampage, leading to Top Man and Mega Man teaming up to stop it. Tensuke gets better at net battling and his grandson is impressed. I guess this one wasn't dubbed just due to time constraints and that it's not very story relevant, or it could be because Tensuke committed copyright infringement by making a battle top very similar to Beyblades. Honestly, so far, this one has been my favorite of the undubbed episodes from the first two series, and in my opinion, an improvement on the Top Man scenario from the game. This is our last unlocalized episode of Access, Rush Runs Away. This one has two main plots. The first is that Meilu is taking care of a new cat, and Rush keeps getting into trouble for misunderstandings. Meilu and Lan say that they should get rid of him. It's clear to us that they're joking, but it's very mean-spirited. Rush gets sad and runs away, encountering repeated misfortune, though eventually befriending a Moloko virus. The B-plot has Bubble Man stealing energy from the power plant to revive Shade Man, leading to blackouts across the city. After Bubble Man is stopped, Rush comes back home. Lan at least gets some comeuppance by losing his homework in the blackout twice, but he and Meilu never apologize, so this episode was just mean. I guess this one wasn't dubbed because it was just a whole lot of filler and has very little dialogue, mostly just following Rush and the Moloko around. But why do the sheep viruses have buttholes? Alright, I'm working on the next part of the Battle Network Iceberg video, and I needed to get some footage, but then I found something odd. At the end of Battle Network 1, in the first World 3 computer, Mega Man can't pass this giant wall of fire, and Glide teleports in and extinguishes the flames. The thing is, I've beaten Battle Network 1 multiple times throughout my life, and I could have sworn that in this game, he was supposed to shout Glide Flash upon using this ability. But during my revisit, in both the original version and the Operation Shooting Star remake, he doesn't say it. He does say this attack's name in Battle Network 6, though, but me and several friends call this move Glide Flash years before Battle Network 6 even came out. Although, in Battle Network 1, Roll says Roll Flash when she helps Mega Man in later sections. So, am I just misremembering, or did I accidentally jump to another timeline again? This isn't the first time I've experienced the Mandela Effect, but this one really bugs me. Do you remember Glide saying Glide Flash in Battle Network 1, or is it just me? It may be just because my brain is still in Iceberg Conspiracy mode, but I had a silly thought. Remember I mentioned that this Navi here on the Bronze, Silver, and Goldfist battleships doesn't have a name? What if this is the Iron Man from the BBS boards? These chips first appeared in Battle Network 2, the same game the BBS post is from, and the Navi's design looks kinda similar to the first Iron Man armor used in the comics and the first movie. On the Goldfist chip, his hand is gold, and on all three, his cape is red. The two most iconic colors associated with Iron Man from Marvel are gold and red. So, what do you think? Have we found Iron Man Dideaxe, or am I just stretching way too far with this one? Either way, that doesn't tell us who the Paladin of the Hero Sword chip is. When it comes to early game reviews from the early 2000s on websites and in magazines and such, I've seen my fair share of sketchy, biased, or just plain dishonest reviews. But this one is a real stinker. This isn't the case where they gave the game an inflated score, but quite the opposite. This review from the UK magazine Advanced, which covers Game Boy Advance games, gave a piss-poor take on the first Mega Man Battle Network game. This review was so horrendous that I don't think the reviewer even played the game. Listen to this nonsense. What do you get if you transplant Mega Man into the wonderful world of a Pokemon ripoff? Good old Mega Man, champion of the arcade platform genre, finds himself trapped in a world of computer viruses, Tokyo dormitories, and a disturbingly Ash-like kid. So, taking the role of Mega Man's trainer, you set out on a journey through virus-infected hard disk corridors, giving Mega Man orders on how to battle the viruses he faces. These battles take the form of turn-based scraps, in which you take it in turns, very sporting that, to give each other slaps. Gameplay. Dull, dull, and dull dull, like chess gone very badly wrong. Difficulty, it's hard to progress quickly, and it's even harder to persevere with. Top tip, try to remember that the endless battles will cease once the power has been turned off. This will help to avert any potential for long-term psychological damage. It's clear to me that they didn't even play the game for more than five minutes before calling it quits and spitting out this schlock of an article. John T. Davies, I don't know who you are, but you really need to hone your reviewing craft. Also, you can't really expect people to trust your reviews of a game when your screenshots don't even show outside the second room of the game. I do appreciate the irony of the lifespan section, though. Admittedly expansive, but who could really stand more than a few hours of this? As well as the comments saying, ultimately though, this is a game that will be quickly forgotten. Funny talk coming from a magazine that only got 8 issues, while the fans of this game are still around 20 years later, waiting on the Legacy Collection with bated breath. 
We've taken a look at a terrible Battle Network review, so let's look at another strange article, this one being for the first Mega Man X game. Looking at GamePro Magazine's September 1993 issue, we can see some early screenshots from the game, as well as some very interesting art of X himself. The screenshots give us a look at some scenery and enemies that didn't make it into the final cut of the game. The text is a bit more perplexing, though. The article details how this new iteration of Mega Man is part of a robo-police comprised of half-human and half-robotic cops. I'm not sure if it means that half of the people are humans and half of them are robots, or if it means that they're all cyborgs. It also mentions two new characters named RX and RY, who escaped from the facility that reprograms the robo-police into being evil. This article was from three months before the game would be released in December, so I'm not sure if this means that they had old info from the earlier stages of development, or if these elements were altered that close to the release date. Either way, it is fun to look back on the history of our favorite games, but the advice to replay the classics before X won't help you much when the X series has such different controls, with dashing and wall climbing and such. I made a short a while back covering how the so-called Legendary Program Advance from the early arcs of the anime wasn't actually Life Sword, but was, in fact, Beta Sword, which is a far less interesting PA exclusive to Battle Network 1 and Operation Shooting Star. Or was it actually Life Sword the whole time? In Access, the same combination of chips creates basically the same program advance, and in the movie Program of Light and Darkness, Mega Man uses Dream Sword, which is the Japanese name of Life Sword, and the animation pattern is nearly identical to the Beta Sword from earlier on. And in the final episode of the anime, Cross Fusion Mega Man uses Dream Sword against Cash, and the attack looks eerily similar. So what do you think? Was it actually meant to be Life Sword the entire time, and they just called it Beta Sword because of the first game, and it was just retconned later on? Or is this just one of those tiny production details that we don't need to sweat because it just doesn't really matter? 